Amen. Amen. Well, have you ever had a season in your life where it just felt you were constantly under attack? <laughs> I mean, full battle is raging, coming straight at you. Maybe that season is right now for you. And maybe it's relationally, relationally right now, like your home is a battlefield. Your marriage is under attack. Your, your relationship with your kids is under attack. Maybe at work, it just seems like there's a cancerous DNA in the culture at work. And relationally, you just feel totally under attack. Maybe physically. Maybe physically, maybe your body is, is under attack. Financially. <laughs> maybe your bank account is under attack right now. You know, one of the struggles, and I've been talking about this quite a bit, that I feel a lot of Christians are in in this season, and maybe this pertains to you, but mentally under attack. Like your mind, it just seems like constant, you have these weird thoughts and these, these random evil thoughts that are trying to make it into your brain, and it just feels like it's an onslaught mentally. And we could go on and on, and I'm not sure where you're at, just this week, actually, all throughout the entire church, some of my great friends have been crazy under attack. I'll give you a couple examples. Typically, right here on the front row, uh, one of my favorite couples in the church. Now, Jesus had favorites, by the way, so the pastor can have favorites, okay? So any anyway, these two seasoned saints, old school Calvary Chapel people, just salt of the earth type people, I just love their example. The man working through a deadly disease, still worshiping God with all his heart. And they wanted to go on a bucket list trip, so they went up into the Northeast, and in the middle of the, of the trip, he trips, falls and hits his head on a rock, and breaks his like neck, his back, and now is fighting for his life right now. You talk about under attack physically, this man is right there. And imagine being his wife. He's struggling with a deadly disease, and then he trips and falls, and has this happen? You talk about the mental anguish that she's going through. We have a, a, a couple at the church that we're, we've drawn really close to, great friends, and we meet with regularly, and she, her mom had heart surgery. It didn't go well. She ended up passing away this week. A year before, her dad passed away. Can you imagine? So here, we're trying to celebrate July 4th, and she's just dealing with a lot of heartache and anguish of soul. This attack, she's under attack. One of my best friends in the ministry, he's a pastor here, working through probably the, the toughest personal issue he's ever dealt with with his children. And I could go on and on, and I'm not, if I knew all your story, I would we'd probably spend the rest of this church service talking about how we're under attack. I think it's super important when we're under attack to know the source of what is bringing the attack. Do you know, if you're a Christian in here, biblically you have three enemies. You know what the, the three enemies? The world, the flesh, and the devil. Could it be Satan, right? Church, church lady. <laughs> sometimes, we, sometimes when... Satan's best trick is to make people think that he doesn't exist. He's real. But I think also a mistake is we say that we're going through spiritual warfare where really it's me, the world. The world is one of our, our, our enemies. And many times it's the world that is causing the attack. The world system is wild and it tries to squeeze us into the world system. In fact, God created the world completely different than it is right now. I don't know if you knew that. When he first created the world, he made Adam, and he like breathed life into him. He's like, yo, go like work hard in the garden, and we're just gonna like hang out. And God's perfect, man's perfect, no beef. They would take walks in the cool of the day. This beautiful communion. That's how God originally created this world. Tragically, to create True love, he had to create free will. He makes this tree with this bomb fruit. He's like, yo, you can have whatever you want. Stay away from that tree right there. And what do we do? Ooh. 
We eat that and now sin enters the world and spreads throughout the world. The world you see now with the hurricanes and disease and abuse, that was not God's original intent. And so now we are under attack from the circumstances of our own human choices. And we deal with it. The flesh, how about the flesh? You know what the flesh is? The flesh is those desires that God gave us that are good, that we get out of bounds and we take elsewhere to meet those needs. If I'm horny, I'm just gonna have sex with whoever I want. If I'm hungry, I'm just gonna eat whatever I want. I was thinking about this. Um, what's that cake that it's like chocolate cake, but it's not totally made, and it's like there's some soft stuff in the middle? What is that called again? Oh, lava cake, dude, I'm telling you. Like, I, I blame it on the devil. You know what it is? It's, it's my weakness of my flesh. I'm like, yo, I will crush that right there with some like ice cream right there, that vanilla ice cream. Oh, dude. And then you just feel so guilty after talking about I'm under attack. My belly's under attack. No, you, you were the one that did it. <laughs> now, third one is the devil. And listen now, specifically, tune in Christian. Maybe you just became a Christian and you're wanting to go after God, and you're wanting to help as many people as you can experience what you've been able to experience. You're forgiven, you're free, you're going to heaven, you have deep peace, and so now you're on a mission to tell as many people as you can about Jesus. Just know, don't be scared, don't be freaked out, but know you're gonna be under attack. Why? Well, it makes sense. Listen, before you came onto God's team, you were on the devil's team, let's just call it real. You were on team darkness, and you were on your way to hell. And so you weren't a threat to Satan at that point. In fact, you were on his team. And then your eyes are open. You're like, oh my goodness, I've been hoodwinked by the enemy. And you repented of your sin. You turned. You went from team darkness to team light. And now the enemy's like, okay, now that, that sister right there, she's a threat. And now you, you're under spiritual attack, spiritual warfare. The best way I can describe this in my life is athletically, and I apologize, bear with me. We're my athletes in the house of God at all. Okay, raise your hand. We're my non-athletes, raise your hand. Okay, so I can, okay. Uh, okay, so I'm just gonna help you a little bit. So there's this game called football, and uh, <laughs> football, it's this weird game. It's like this, this uh, oblong pigskin shaped ball and the idea of it is you take the ball and you either run it or throw it and you try to score a touchdown and you get six points for a touchdown and then you kick a PAT, you get one point. And so at the end of the game, the team that has the most points, okay, wins, good. And my job as a football player, I was called what's called a quarterback. So I would get that oblong pig skin and I would either hand it off to someone to run, I would run it myself, or I'd drop back and I'd pass it to another player on the team and they would catch it and then move forward. You guys with me? This game is called football. And uh, <laughs> so I'd move forward and sometimes, man, as an offense, often, by the way, as a Christian, be on offense, man. Let's go. Like, don't play around. So we would be on offense, we'd move the ball forward and we'd get in a rhythm. And on the defensive side, they had a guy called the defensive coordinator who called the plays for the defense. He'd get desperate, and from the skybox, he'd, he'd see what's happening. He'd call what's called a blitz. You guys know what a blitz is? A blitz is like, we gotta send everybody to go grab that stupid quarterback and kill him. And that happened in our life. In fact, there's, yeah, there's the picture right there. All these players just loading the line of scrimmage, and you're the quarterback talking about, oh, that's the best way I can describe it. When you and I are used of God scoring touchdowns for Jesus and people are entering into glory, just know the Bible says be sober, be vigilant because the enemy, the enemy of your soul, Satan, he, he, he roars like a lion. He's seeking whom he can devour. The Bible says, Jesus said, the thief came to steal, kill, and to destroy. Don't, don't like... Don't be like caught off guard and say, oh, dude, I can't believe that I'm under attack. Listen, no, you will be. The enemy will get desperate and call a blitz and come in your face and try to kill you. That's just how it is. Now, don't be scared because why? 
You got the greatest offensive coordinator in the world, baby. You got God on your side, and he's well capable to take care of you. And that's the picture we see in Isaiah if you were reading your daily reading. You saw this. You saw King Hezekiah, who was the king of what's called Judah. You remember after Solomon, his son fumbled the biscuit, and God's nation divided into two. You had the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. Hezekiah was a great king, great quarterback, making moves for God. And what happened? Now the king of Assyria, who's a type of Satan in the scripture, he sees what's happening. He's going to full on blitz King Hezekiah. And in chapter 36, I just want you to see some of the threats and some of the attacks of King Snacherib of Assyria, and I want you to identify these same type of attacks in your life. Expect them. And number one, if you're a note taker, and it's funny how the, the enemy has like a bag of tricks. He's, been, he's got the same bag of tricks for years. So I want you to be aware of them. Number one, if you're a note taker, write it down this way, doubt. One of the greatest threats that the enemy will send at you is doubt. It'll be a dagger of doubt that will be sent your way in your mind. And the scripture is in Isaiah 36, starting in verse four. Watch what the Bible says. Then the Assyrian king's chief of staff told them to give this message to Hezekiah. Put yourself in Hezekiah's shoes. He's, you're the leader of God's chosen people. You're right there. And this letter, this threatening letter comes to you. This is what the great king of Assyria says. What are you trusting in that makes you so confident? Do you think that mere words can substitute for military skill and strength? Who are you really counting on that you've rebelled against me? Pause there real quick. What's happening? King Hezekiah is well aware that the Assyrians are taking over the entire area of Middle East. They just ransacked the northern kingdom of Israel. In fact, they were wiping out some of the southern towns as well. And he's observing this and put yourself in, in this position as a king. You're like, oh my goodness. And now the threat is coming straight at you. Imagine right now, like in our world today, some of the nations that are doing the same exact thing. You're on the receiving end. And this letter is saying, do you really think God's gonna bail you out? Do you really think, I mean, look around. And I feel like that's the same thing he does right now and you might be feeling it. Here, here's, how, here's how it's formed. Do you really think that God can restore your marriage? Do you really think that God can give you a second chance? Do you really think that you can raise children? You don't, you weren't raised in a godly home. Do you really think that you can do it? I think of moms right now. Let's give it up for our moms in the house, by the way. You guys are amazing. I think about the attacks of doubt. You don't have what it takes. Let me just say, you do have what it takes. If you have the spirit of God upon you and you have the scriptures that are leading your life, you're fully equipped. You, you, don't, you don't believe the lie of doubt. And number two, you don't believe the lie of fear. You can jot that down as well. This is another attack of the enemy that he's been rolling for years. This has happened to me this week. I'm preparing for this message. I'm studying like I'm in the word, man. I'm in Isaiah 36, 37. It's at a lo local coffee shop. And I promise you, out of the blue, I get this wave of fear of the enemy. It was like a feeling of fear. And I'm like, this is so irrational. I'm in Omaha, Nebraska, middle America, in a coffee store. I'm not in the middle of a raging war. But you know where the war was? It was right here. It was this fear coming over me, and I was like, man, I gotta battle this whole thing. It was the enemy saying, no, I'm gonna get this pastor off track so he doesn't bring this word of God to people that need it right now. It was this fear that just started gripping me. And the same thing, it's part of this letter. Hezekiah gets attacked with doubt as the leader, and then this king also wants to put fear in the rest of the people of Israel, not just the leader. And so he sends his minions to come share this message of fear. He begins sharing this, 
and King Hezekiah's guys that are receiving his inner cabinet are hearing it, and they're like, yo, can you just like talk in Aramaic? Don't speak in Hebrew. I don't want my people to hear. And the Rab Shekha says, actually, King Snacherib wants everybody to know that we are coming for you. Look what it says now in verse 12. But Snacherib's chief of staff replied, do you think my master sent this message only to you and to your master? He wants all the people to hear it. For when we put this city under siege, they were suffer, suffer along with you. And this hit me. I don't know if you read this in your Bible this week. This blew me away. They'll be so hungry and thirsty that they will eat their own dung and drink their own urine. Some will say, ooh. I was reading that. I was like, man, if I would be scared too. I don't want to eat my own doo-doo drink my own pee-pee, I'd be like, yo, where do I sign to just surrender right now? Fear. You ever been in that position where you're so fearful, you're like, I don't know I'm gonna pay my mortgage. I have no idea I'm gonna feed my family. And you're so desperate, you're like, you know what, I might tap right now. And I'm, I'm just overcome with fear. I remember this clearly. <laughs> I don't know if you remember a couple years ago, we were in this thing called a pandemic, and we just, we were building the building. The building, this building you're in right now was half done in the middle of the pandemic. And everybody's losing their minds and people are freaking out, including your boy, Pastor Todd. Because I was overcome with fear. I just got done preaching at God's Garage, which were my God's Garage folks up in here. And who knows about God's Garage? Four people. We used to, we used to preach in this little garage meets the sanctuary type thing. We'd pack like 200 people in during the pandemic preaching the word. And I remember going, what is, God, what is gonna happen? I remember after preaching, I came over to this building. I might have shared this before. And I just felt God was like, you, you just need to get on your face. And I remember walking up this stage. It was concrete. It wasn't finished. And I remember getting on my face before God and just crying out because I was like, I feel like a fool there's no way we're gonna be able to have the finances to finish this. And I was overcome with fear. God. It was wild, man, because as I was praying, I looked over and there was this cup, this white cup with black letters. It said, dream it and do it. And it was like God winking at me saying, don't bow down to this lie of the enemy. I called you to this. I called your team to it. Omaha needs this building in West Omaha because we're about to go reach some souls. And look around. Raise your hand if you've been saved in the last couple years. Just raise your hand real quick. And your life has been changed. See, see, I'm not bound down to fear. And yet, that's where I was, right in the middle of it. The old tactic of the enemy, fear. Maybe one of the biggest ones, though, is compromise. Write it down, jot it down, compromise. And I tell you what, Christian, if you haven't felt it lately, the enemy wants to steal, kill, and to destroy. Here, here's one of his greatest lies. God's holding out on you. You don't have to stop doing that. Just continue on. You know what? Jesus will forgive you for that sin. Go ahead and just continue to do it. Listen, that's the quickest way to, to not experience God's best is compromise. And that's what he talks about. <laughs> Look at this. This is one of the threats of the letter is King Snacherib is basically saying to King Hezekiah and God's people, if you'll just make a deal with me, a deal with the devil and compromise, you know what? I'm gonna let you eat. Look what it says now in verse 16, Isaiah 36, 16. Don't listen to Hezekiah. These are the terms the king of Assyria is offering. Here's the deal with the devil. Here it is. Make peace with me. Open the gates and come out. Then each of you, this, I'll underline this in my Bible, can continue eating from your own grapevine and fig tree and drinking from your own well. In other words, you don't have to worry about the doo-doo and the pee-pee thing that I threatened if you'll just compromise and come with me. Verse 17, I'll arrange to take you to another land like this one, a land of grain and new wine, bread and vineyards. What is the offer of the enemy? The offer is this. 
if you surrender now, what we'll do, we'll take you, we'll move you to another area and repopulate. And that's basically what the Assyrians would do. They would conquer an area, they would threaten them, people would surrender, and then they'd redistribute them. And those people would lose their social identity, their, their strength, and that was the tactic of the enemy. And I thought about this for a second. I'm like, dang, that's exactly what the enemy's doing in the church today. He's saying, just compromise your faith. You don't have to say no to premarital sex. You don't have to say no to pornography. You don't have to say no to bitterness and resentment and unforgiveness. Just, you know, Jesus will forgive you for that. But what does it do? Here's what it creates. Compromise, write this down in your notes, please. Compromise creates captivity. Here's the enemy. Hey, you're desperate. I know you need this. I know you need to eat. If you'll just submit to me, I'll let you eat. And we get so desperate. And, we, and here's, here's the thing. I know people, here, here, they, they're single people. They come to Christ. And they're like, yeah, I know I love God. I want to honor him. But man, sex feels so good. It brings me close to someone. I want to tangibly feel someone. And now I'm like, okay, I'm just going to compromise my faith and go this way. But what happens? You don't know. And I don't know that that compromise leads you to captivity. This happened to me, man. Like women and weed were my deal. And I just couldn't stop it. And what happens? The minute you roll into that, dude, it's like, here, here's the thought. I'm free to sleep with whoever I want and have whatever drug I want. And what, what ends up happening? You go right back into captivity. God says, no, man, I got something better for you. I was, I was studying this and I was thinking about the areas of compromise that I often see in my own life and in the church. And here, just jot them down. These, these might ring true to you. Number one, the company we keep. And you, you know that person that you're hanging around with right now that's toxic, but you like still are hanging out with them? We have a phrase in the church we say all the time, show me your friends and I'll show you your future. My mom, I remember in eighth grade, my mom saw this coming. There was this crazy rebel dude that smoked cigarettes and was, you know, would break into houses and, and uh, in eighth grade too, that's so weird. And I remember my mom spotting that like a mile away, talking about Toddy. Don't go hang out with that guy. You're gonna end up in jail. I compromised, man. I have no idea how we didn't get caught in some of the just gnarly stuff we did. Be careful who you choose to hang out with. Don't compromise that. Not for one, there, there's, there's people in here right now, you're unequally yoked in your relationship. You're compromising to, for the sake of still hanging out with that person. It's gonna handcuff you from God's best. Don't do it. It's people you hang out with. Uh, number two, it's content we consume. Content we consume will lead us astray. And I don't, but here's a good question for you. What are you being tempted with right now to bring into your eyes and bring into your ears that are leading you away from God's best? That's the enemy in your soul coming to ransack you and get you off track. And it could happen in little things. I'll give you an example. Before Denise and I go to bed, we read a devotional together. It's literally a minute. It's not some long preacher deal, because I don't know about you, but at the end of the day, my eyes are like, it's quick. And my wife, I want to honor her, she wrote this amazing devotional, and so she's been leading us through it. It's like a minute, and we pray. And then sometimes we'll have this little iPad, and we'll, we'll like watch a, maybe a little show as we go to bed. Anybody, any sinners like me sometimes, right? And, and so you got to be careful what content you consume at that point. And there, there was this kind of like a investigative show that we were watching. And I found myself like going, what am I watching right now? And there's murder and killing and, you know, different stuff. And I'm like, I don't know if I could say that to the glory of God. I'm like taking that in, that content into my soul. And I found myself wrestling at night, not getting sleep. And so we had to, man, repent of that and convert our, uh, our content on our iPad to some crazy horse show. <laughs> Rated G horse show. Talk about get yourself to sleep real quick. And man, I was snoozing so quick. So I don't know, maybe that is. And then number three, the sins we settle into. The sins we settle into. And this really is the, the, the epitome of compromising our faith. It's one thing, let me just say this. Let me free you real quick, saint. 
You've come to Christ and you're like, dude, I thought I was gonna float around, polish my halo and never do anything wrong. Can I just tell you? No, saints sin. The only question is, are you stumbling into sin? Are you settling into sin? And I'll give you an illustration that might, may help you. I've shared this before. We had twin boys and when they were young, we were at a movie and it was a thunderstorm during the movie, kind of like yesterday. Puddles everywhere. We had just bought them new shoes. And so we were leaving the movie theater and I said, hey boys, be careful not to walk into any puddles. You have new shoes on. And so I have two kids that are totally different. One a little more ADD. We're my ADD folks, okay? So love, love that dude. And so he was kind of walking out of the movie theater, and there was a plane that was starting to fly by. He's like, oh, oh my God, you know, and stepped right into a big old puddle. And dude, soiled his shoes, and I'm like, you know what? Hey, bro, like, I, no problem. You didn't mean to do that. You, you stumbled into sin. Cleaned it off as a good dad, and we're good. Now the other boy wasn't stumbling into sin. That dude was settling into that sin. He waited until I turned around. As soon as I turned around, homie was like, okay, he, dad's gone. <laughs> he jumped right into that thing. That wasn't stumbling into sin. That was settling in. He's, you know, doing one of those numbers. And I would just say this. Listen, I hope you hear this as your pastor I got same temptations and I do dumb stuff just like you do. But when we trip in, get out, man. Don't settle in that. You're, what are you doing? You're, head, you're handcuffing God from unleashing his favor and his best in your life, just like he does for me. Many times, I, I'm, head, I'm just stiff arming God. I'm like, what are we doing over here? Don't do it. I was studying the word for... Uh, um, for drugs, this was an interesting thing. It's the Greek words pharmakia. And when we enter into drugs or uh, pornography, it's pornea. What it does, I don't know if you knew this or not, it opens a window for demonic to come into your life and you're wondering why things are dark in your life and you're under attack. Listen, we invited it in. And you better get some prayer, man, and some exorcism to get the demonic out of your life and then shut down that phone, shut down the content, do whatever you need to do to get out of the puddle. If you want God's best. Now listen, listen, listen. Will God still love you? Are you still going to heaven? You know, hey, listen, God's love never changes. The result of our life will change. The fruit of your, you, you don't want to experience God's best? Stay in the puddle. That's fine. You're surprised still go to heaven if you're truly converted. But man, my heart and God's heart is, why would you settle for anything less than God's best? I, I would say, man, like Liz, hop out the puddle and move forward. I think the last thing I would say, if you're struggling with bitterness and resentment, particularly if another Christian has sinned against you and said something or done something, let me lovingly encourage like I always do. Go to that individual with humility and address the issue and ask for forgiveness for the resentment and bitterness that you did. You take ownership, give them a chance to forgive so you, be, you can be reconciled. The Bible says if we don't, that bitterness is an open door for the enemy to come in and divide in the church and divide in your family. You've been forgiven? Where, where all my saints have been forgiven? Millions of dollars of, saint, or of sins up in here. And yet I'm strangling out my fellow believer because they sinned against me for thousands of dollars. I've been forgiven millions. You think in one second that I'm gonna strangle someone out? No way. And that's the challenge. Don't let bitterness be a stronghold in your life. Okay. Anybody with me? Anybody under? I'm under attack with every single thing I just said. I got good news for you though. Do you want a formula to be released? You want a formula to fight the attack? I'm ready to give it if you are. Because the very next chapter, King Hezekiah gives us a model how to beat this battle. Number one, he gains perspective. Just jot it down real quick. And, and, I'll, and I'll direct you to the very next chapter, Isaiah 37, starting in verse one. This is so on point. Watch what he says. When King Hezekiah heard their report, he tore his clothes, he put on burlap. It's okay to be emotional when you're in the fire, when you're under attack. But don't stop there. Look what he did. And what did he do, church? His first reaction, he went into the temple of the Lord. 
What's the first response when you're under attack? I'm, I'm posting, I'm calling. You know what the best thing to do? Go to the darn temple, go to church. Someone say church. Church. Some, I, sometimes there's weeks where I'm under attack the entire week. I'm barely getting here. And I'll be right in that front row. And the minute the first note hits and I hear Austin Lou just belted out by the Spirit of God, I'm like, I'm here. I, sometimes I just need to leave it before God. And that's what's happening with Hezekiah. The attack is on, and he's like, man, I am struggling right now. He's honest about it, but he does the right thing. He goes to church to get perspective. I think our, our, our problem in the church, we get tunnel vision. And I'm so focused on my problem, the relational attack, the financial attack. I get such tunnel vision that sometimes when I get to church, it's almost like I elevate and, I, and it pans out and I can see something bigger than myself, bigger than the problem. What was really cool about playing quarterback is when we were under attack, when we had blitzes coming right and left, at the end of a drive, I'd get on the sideline and I'd call up to the coach. And the coach, they might have a picture of it, the coach was up in the box, in the press box. And the beauty of calling the coach is the coach would have a different perspective than I did. See, I'm on the field as a quarterback. I'm in the heat of the battle. But the coaches, you might want to go to the next picture. The coaches were so high, they could see everything going on. They could see where the attacks were coming from. That's a different picture. You see, the quarterback right there, he's about to get the snap. I think that's Jalen Hurts. I wish I was Jalen Hurts sometimes. Not right there, though, because he's under attack. But there's something about panning out. And, and now, Hezekiah, he spreads it before God. He's like, God... I'm under attack. Number one, perspective. And number two, if you're a note taker, just jot it down. He breaks into prayer. I wrote it in my notes this way. Change, change the play, begin to pray. I like that. I'd be up on the line of scrimmage. I'd see the threat of the enemy coming on a full blitz. I'd be like, check, 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 check. And I would change the play. Some Christians here today, you're freaking out, you're posting, you need to stop posting and begin praying. You, you somehow, some way, and that's exactly what Hezekiah does. Look at verse 15 of now, chapter 37. This is what he says. And Hezekiah prayed this prayer before the Lord. So he, he goes to church, he gets perspective, he breaks out in prayer, and listen to his prayer. His prayer is fascinating. Watch this. O Lord of heaven's armies, God of Israel, you are enthroned between mighty cherubim. If you're new to the Bible, the word cherubim are like big swole angels. Just picture rock, you know, up in heaven, like protecting God right there. You alone are God. You are alone are God of all the kingdoms of the earth. You alone, watch this. Talk about getting perspective through prayer. You alone created the heavens and the earth. Bend down, O Lord. And listen, open your eyes, O oh Lord, and see. I like this prayer. Listen to this prayer. Listen to King Sennacherib's words of defiance against the living God. <laughs> How awesome is that? He's like, God, you've been hearing what this guy's talking about you. He's talking all kinds of kind of noise. I might have to have you release and get after this cat because right now he's on my back. He's up in my grill. This threat is coming. Are you listening to what this king is threatening, talking about, oh, I'm conquering all these other lands and all these other gods, but you're the true God. You're the one who can save. This week, I got a text from one of our friends. As I mentioned, her mom passed away this week, complications in her heart a, a year before her dad passes away. And we were just praying for him all week. And she sends this text. I want to read it for you because I think it's, there's something powerful about when you're under attack when you go to prayer. I just can't explain it, but something can shift in the heavenlies that can't physically change. And I've seen it happen so, so often. And I'm just going to read a little bit from what she texted back. She said, all I can do is run back and jump into my father's lap just to be held and to be embraced. 
I got that word embrace three days ago. It jumped off the page and hit me hard. I thought, what is she reading when she's under attack? She's reading the scriptures. The enemy, when, he's, when we're under attack, he wants to separate us from the scriptures. You know what the best place is? Is to get into that scripture. Hear from God. She said, I, I keep saying, God, you're sovereign. In other words, you're in control. Jesus, I trust you, and I thank you for the blessings. Listen to this that have come from this and will continue to come. She's thanking God even in the middle of being under attack, mentally and emotionally. And then she says, Jesus, I trust you. And I love this. She said, in parentheses, deep breath in. Let's just take a deep breath at church real quick. So powerful. The attack it's like I breathe in Jesus, I exhale the lie, bring in truth. Jesus, I trust you. And then she finishes in a powerful way. I'm grateful as I feel God's love shower down on me, sometimes tangibly. He is so good, even in the storms. It's powerful. I love Hezekiah. He gets perspective, he begins to pray. And by the way, Jot it down in your notes. I think it's 2 Corinthians 10. This is so powerful. When you're under attack, we don't fight spiritual battles in a physical way. Here's what we do. It says uh, in verse three, we are human, but we don't wage war as humans do. I asked our staff, like, what's your first reaction when you're under attack? One of my friends said, I go, I go find my friends with guns. <laughs> I was like, that's hilarious. How about we got spiritual guns, right? And verse four, we use God's mighty weapons, not worldly weapons. Some of you think that your spouse is your enemy. No, the enemy is the enemy. And what you need to do is get on your face and pray. When there's division in the church, you know what I say? Let's get into my office and pray and worship and see that God will break these strongholds in this division in the heavenlies. And if we're courageous enough to actually do it, you'll see God show up in powerful ways. It's not, these are God's mighty weapons, not worldly weapons, to knock down the strongholds of human reasoning and to destroy what? False arguments, the lies. This whole letter that was sent through King Snacherib was a lie of the enemy. And Hezekiah had a choice. Do I believe it and bow down and surrender? Or do I stand steady in the midst of this opposition? He gains altitude, he gains perspective, he prays, and finally, man, protection, write it down. This is my favorite part of this message. Do you know that God has ways to protect you that you have no idea about? I love the amen corner. Like, God's done something for you in the spiritual sense, and you've seen God's hand of protection in your life. And I just wanna show it to you, just skip down to verse 21. This is key now. Part of this whole thing, I don't know if you knew this, Hezekiah and Isaiah were homies. They were tight. And Isaiah, the prophet, Hezekiah sent some of his men. So Hezekiah prayed, but he also asked for prayer. By the way, we have this crossover to the left here, and we say, if you need prayer, you go and let us pray for you. Hezekiah asked Isaiah to pray, and this is Isaiah's response to him. Watch this. <laughs> Isaiah, son of Amos sent this message to Hezekiah, verse 21. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel says, because you prayed about King Snacherib of Assyria. And then in verse, skip down to verse 33. Watch this. His armies will not enter Jerusalem. They will not even shoot an arrow at it. You thought that you were gonna be eating your dung and your urine and the whole thing? Uh-uh. They will, they, they will march, they will not march outside the city gates with their shields nor build banks the siege against the walls. The king, Snacherib, remember that guy? He'll return to his own country by the same road on which he came. He's gonna have, have to pack up and go home. He will not enter this city, says the Lord. Verse 35, for my own honor and for the sake of my servant David, I will defend this city and protect it. Oh, that's so good. That's so good. When I would see the blitz coming, I had to change the protection. I had to change the play, but I also had to change the protection. And again, let me give just one, one last illustration with football. Bear with me. I remember clearly, we were having a, 
inner squad scrimmage at Iowa State. I was the quarterback. There was this mean middle linebacker ready to blitz. And I had to change the play, otherwise he was gonna take my head off. I had this real tough dude named Troy Davis in the backfield, and this guy was mean. And I'm like, yo, you gotta, I gotta check. I'd be like, check, 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 check. Yo, TD, get that cat. I drop back, and TD is back here as the, as the running back. Instead of running a route like he was going to on the play, he came up. That dude came, that blitzing linebacker came full speed. TD gets low, broke the guy's jaw. And this dude was, his whole senior year was drinking his meals through a straw. I was like, okay, TD, you could have chilled out. That's our own player, you know. Why do I share that? Because what? That's exactly how God shows up. Did you read the rest of the story? I, I hope you didn't miss it. Because Hezekiah got perspective and prayed and didn't freak out, God showed up in a powerful way. And in one night, at one time, God sends the angel of the Lord and 185 Assyrian soldiers are killed in one night. And now this threat is happening. They wake up. The Assyrian soldiers see all the corpses and the dead bodies, and they're like, tell you what, uh, the threat's over, boys, and we're going to head out. And they left. And guess what? King Snacherib went home, and just as Isaiah had predicted, his own sons killed him, and he was taken out. The enemy completely taken out. Why? Because Isaiah, a great picture for us, got perspective, he prayed, God released his powerful protection and took out the enemy. Hopefully that's encouraging to you. Let's pray, God, thank you for, we needed this reminder, those of us under attack. And so, as we conclude, I just pray now, blessing and protection over your people. Many of us mentally under attack, physically, would you move like only you can? I pray we'd respond by faith, respond with humility, trusting for you, God, to do what only you can do. I pray if there's division in the church, God, that you would do something powerful to correct it. I pray, God, for if there is marriages that just need to humble themselves and pray and let you show up, I pray you would do it. And that I wanna respond, <laughs> me personally, when I'm under attack, the way Hezekiah did. Thank you for Hezekiah's leadership and his model. In Jesus' name. Before I say amen, I wanna just conclude real quick. I know you have July 4th weekend plans, but if you can just give me the last five to seven minutes here, I just, I wanna speak two things. And if you absolutely have to get to work, that's fine. But if you can just stay with me, I really appreciate it. Two, two things are on my heart. One, I learned a lot this week what it is to pray and worship through attack. And as I mentioned to you, one of my good friends who's right here usually in the front row who fell and broke his back and is struggling for his life, we've been having communication back and forth, talked to his wife, got to pray for them. And they sent me this text, and I wanna show it to you. It's a picture of what my man is doing. This man broke his neck, struggling for his life. And what is he doing? He's worshiping. Can I just tell you, church, worship is your weapon. Praise and prayer is your weapon. And his prayer was this, God, you're sovereign. You do whatever you want. You can heal me. You can take me to heaven. It's your choice. I'm just telling you, man, like that hit me deep. Maybe you needed to hear that today. Maybe you're under attack and you just needed to see this man of faith saying, you know what, God, you got it. So Lord, I pray we'd release anything that we're trying to hold on to. We'd worship you right in the middle of the attack. And I pray for my man, Ken, his wife, Michelle, bless them, God, with your comfort in these days. In Jesus' name.